It was with such anticipation um, in my heart that I had when I knew I could come back to um, this beautiful community that has supported Copenhagen for so many years um, and the friendship we have share shared in that time. I feel enlarged by the covenantal values you espouse as Unitarian Universalists and how you embrace so explicitly the inherent worth and dignity of every person. These principles demand generosity, creativity, deep compassion, some forgiveness, and a willing to, willingness to continue this tradition into the daily experiences of your lives, and my life too, by the same token. Not just when we feel inspired, but every day. Especially today as we witness so many polarities and divisions and inequalities in our society. How do we live these cherished values amid the many, many inequalities that fracture our lives today? And they, that diminish the inherent dignity and worth of every person. I struggle with these issues as well, living as I do now in Australia. I have had great difficulty adjusting to the privilege and entitlement I experienced there after living among the women of Copenhagen for so many years, amid their extremely circumscribed lives. The students I work with in schools may not be so very different from some of your students of the same age in high school um, over here. The entitlement, the sense of um, I'm here and I'm the center of the universe. Um, I was taking a group of year 12 students on retreat and we were walking in the street and the girl ahead of me dropped her, uh, took, uh, finished her candy bar and went to throw it in a street bin and missed it and carried on walking. Um, and I ran up to her and I said, you need to come back and pick up your piece of paper, your candy bar wrapper. And she came back rather reluctantly. She bent down, and there was a, a very similar wrapper beside hers. And I said, you can pick that up too. She said, why should I? It's not mine. We grapple with entitlement. We grapple with trying to convey values that hold us up in the dark and the joy of our lives. Wealth and plenitude do not guarantee a life of purpose, and fulfillment and meaning. Our commitment to build a more just world in which the dignity of every person counts, every person counts, is not only a moral imperative, it is to, it is to connect deep within us and to encounter one another in all our diversity and offer love so that all may flourish. But this is not an individual quest. It needs community, our community, here and now. Maya Angelou's poem prompts us, continue to remind people that each is as good as the other and that no one is beneath nor above you. For me, this is a call to huge love, to be of service to others and the common good the common wheel, I'm not talking about the British Commonwealth, I'm talking about the common wheel that goes down into the hubris of what life means. The women of Copenhagen taught me that in many new ways, how powerful that kind of love is. They have 22 faith affiliations, 12 cultural groups. For many years I have walked with them the haunting spectre of death and HIV AIDS, I have held too many women dying in my arms of AIDS and it is not a pretty sight. Nor is it when you see the woman, one of the women the next morning come in, clearly having experienced violence in the home that night before. The grinding poverty and 80% unemployment, COVID. Yet each woman's enormous capacity to transcend this suffering and find ways to support one another through it all is what is building community there. And it witnesses their huge capacity for life, generosity and forgiveness as a community. 
In case you think this is all very idealistic, it has not been an easy path. Apartheid divided everything in their lives horrifically. Many women there were, from, um, were forcibly removed to that area. Even my wish to bring two racially, particularly two racially divided groups together, the black African and the so-called colored Afrikaans people to build community together, was predicted to fail dismally by a renowned activist who said it had been tried so many times and had failed. Is that a reason to stop trying? The Copenhagen women's motto is never give up. I didn't, the women of Copenhagen didn't. Slowly through courage and persistence, we kept confronting and naming the differences until we built enough heart, enough dialogue to trust and hope in one another. And we found, not surprisingly, there was far more to unite us than divide us, a learning together how to support the common good. Their faith was a strong factor of communion through so many difficulties. One woman came into the project in the morning. Um, we began our prayer as we always do to open the day and a woman chooses a, a, a piece of scripture to share and to reflect on. And as we were listening to this gospel reading, the tears came down and we knew that she was in trouble. And one of the women started a lullaby and the lullaby eventually came to words. And at some moment, not organized, not engineered, in the singing, we experienced ourselves as community, holding this woman and the presence of what you might call God or um, a, a, the power of being. At that moment, there was a sense of absolute solidarity. And the song went back to a, a lullaby and there was such silence in that circle of women. We could not fix her trouble, we could not fix her sorrow, but she knew we were with us, that we were with her and with one another. While such courage and solidarity are true of the Copenhagen women, the other side revealed the challenges of the daily grind with cultural power struggles, Poverty that sometimes brought out the worst by poor choices of petty theft and gossip in the group, and then the need to again and again recommit to restoring right relationships, again and again, trying to live up to their best selves because they knew when they lived into their best selves, their lives were expanded by that experience. I think we are all a work in progress. The hymn we sung says, come, yet again come. Come to that place where we are willing to recommit to build right relationships. The Unitarian Universalist Covenant challenges each of us to, infer, uh, to affirm the inherent wife, sorry, worth and dignity of all life. This makes a sweeping claim for us to engage our hearts and minds to accept others with real differences, religious traditions, lifestyles, cultural values, political alliances, sexual orientation. We are all interconnected. There is no other. There is not them. There is only us. The work is here in front of us. We hope for good companions among each other, willing to engage in serious thought. We hope for openness to learning, that can stretch our understanding and lead us out to meet the stranger or whom we have perceived in the past as the other or the different. It inevitably means that we choose to stay with the discomfort and tension of unanswered questions. It's not an immediate thing. And to live with the scars and the incompleteness of my incompleteness and yours, to reflect honestly how are we living our lives and how, do we do, how can we do better in this very unequal world where we find ourselves so privileged? How can we come to encounter one another, which may also be a call for forgiveness? I need you to teach me the greater sensitivity around areas that I may be insensitive to, 
to call me out with respect when I might say something or act in some way that is not my best self and maybe I need to learn more about you and, and your way of living. This is very difficult to do in a very unequal world. We have been irrevocably influenced by the Western capitalist system for centuries that has relentlessly and consciously exploited its natural and human resources for extractive, economy-driven goals, leaving few obscenely rich, so many, many poor, and the rest struggling in between. Where is worth and dignity in that scenario? Millions are robbed of hope, land, shelter, and meaningful labor. These consumerist systems cannot survive today without the complicity of powerful corporates and us. Just about everything we use is a result of another's life, another's worth. How have we been complicit in propping it up? I try to teach values to the students I work with and I have them do a mindfulness map of the first two hours of their day. Whose sheets, where did the sheets come from that you slept on? Eventually somebody will say China or Egypt. Do you know China has um, human abuse, um, prob huge human abuse problems? Did you, what did you have for breakfast? I had oranges, an orange and um, orange juice and cornflakes. That needed a farmer, it needed an orchard, it needed a harvester, it needed a canner, it needed a distributor. There are millions, hundreds at least, who have made up our quality of life this morning. And for myself, I have to keep asking myself, where am I in propping up a system that has shown so little human dignity and worth? I live in two states in Australia, um, six months of the year in Sydney and six months of the year in Melbourne. And I have a very difficult time and I need to come to change this because my unit that I live in stays unoccupied for six months. This cannot persist. It calls me to make a change where um, human dignity and worth are honored. It's not that goods in themselves are bad, they're not, nor the quality of life that we can endure along with all other forms of flourishing, including working to sustain our, our earth creation. The reality is that such flourishing has not been for all. Our choices do impact on others. I know this community reaches out with such generosity and works in so many sectors to improve life for others. This is wonderful. We are a work in progress as we continue to try to build a more deeper and compassionate and more equal community by the choices we make to sustain and protect others. There is much work to be done. We need to rely heavily on one another to be our fullest expression of what it means to be human. This is the deep change we need, to know that we are born not just for connection, but for encounter, and to work hard at what that means together. Consciously to stop, to engage with human kindness with our presence, not to pass someone by quickly because they are the other, they are different, they actually are us. I heard the story recently of a corporate woman in a piazza. Um, she walked past um, a man who was sitting in the middle of the piazza, um, a blind man who had his begging basket in front of him and a, a sign and um, saying, please, can you help? And she walked past and she came back and the man felt her shoes um, and she said, can I write something on your cardboard and he said yes she turned it over and she said it is a beautiful day today but i am blind and i cannot see it and she put that down and she went off to work she came back later in the day and stood in front of him and again he felt the shape of her shoes he said what did you write on that card and she told him because he had received many donations that day 
This story goes way beyond the physically blind to a change of perspective to encounter. She was willing to look into his eyes and think, thought that she could do something that could help him. It takes us to new territories of the heart, new possibilities of relationship and gratitude. We do have choices to make as individuals and as a Unitarian Universalist community to question our way of being. Many live on the edge of our streets, homeless, voiceless, in mental distress, living in a world that doesn't really care. Let us accept no limitations to our potential to reach out in service as a community. What good is knowing what's wrong with our world unless it's coupled with caring and action? Life is such a precious gift, not a community, not a commodity. We will care. You have shown how much you care for 22 years to the women of Copenhagen. Um, and I have no words to express my thanks, what is deepest in me, for you literally keeping them alive and keeping them dignity, dignifies, died, sorry, dignified. And it's that grateful, gratefulness, that living in a spirit of gratitude and thankfulness for what we do have helps us to understand the disparities and inequalities around us. We need to do that as community because we need community to sustain us for the hard work we need to continue to do together. Maya Angelou said, continue to let gratitude be the ground on which you kneel to say your nightly prayer and let your faith here be the bridge to build, to overcome evil and welcome good. Oh, that we could nurture that spirit of gratitude for all we do experience. I make this plea for myself. Anything I say, I'm also saying for myself. Gratitude is a spiritual practice that allows us to be open to all that is holy and all that is beautiful within us and outside of us, even the in the most difficult, aversive and threatening experiences. In a particular way, the students on immersion that I would take three times a year before COVID to, Cop uh, to Copenhagen learned a lesson in gratitude from a small boy, the importance of both giving and receiving. They cooked the meals for 300 orphans. They'd never seen so many carrots or vegetables in their lives before and never done that much peeling in their mother's kitchen, I'm sure. They went out to feed these children, um, first of all at the project and then at a satellite place. Um, and they took uh, skipping ropes and, and, and balls and, and they played and the, girl, the children taught the girls Zulu dancing. Um, and it was their last day, and the children go, get sent home with either half a loaf of bread or an apple. This day they were being given a pear. That was, that was an absolute luxury for these children. And one little boy came up to one of the girls I was standing near, and he, he had his pear in his hand, and he said to her, this is all I have, we're so sad you're going, this is my way of thank, saying thank you to you. And I heard her say, I can't take that, and I whispered in her ear, she must take that. This is the most beautiful gift perhaps she will receive in her life. And she took it, but all the way back to the project where we were going to debrief, the tears came down. We sat, 12 students and three teachers, sat around and expressed what that experience was for them, that this child was ministering to them with the, with, with the experience of deep gratitude. And we cut the pear into the 15 of, for the 15 of us that shared it. We learn so much from children and those who are defenseless. They are open books for us if we would open them. Maya says, continue to take the hand of the despised and diseased and the vulnerable and walk proudly with them in the high street. Some might see you and be encouraged to do likewise. I know those girls came back to Australia and looked at life very differently. This begs the question, of course, are we willing to take the hands of all, the healthy, the despised, the diseased, in building respectful relationships across the many divides of difference? May we work for the vulnerable on our streets, continue to work for them um, from our congregation here how easily this is said, 
but how very hard it is to do for the long haul. May we be brave enough to continue recognizing the inherent dignity and worth of all life with each other and be blessed and receive what it is that we receive in gift from those whom we may serve. We are not here part of a throwaway culture. This is the huge discipline we are called to as a community to stay faithful to what truly matters. When we care for each other, not just our families or church or neighborhood, but beyond the edge and with the minorities, encountering those who may be different from us, awe arises in us, a sense of presence and sacredness for all of life. It requires hard work, patience, mutuality, listening, a collaboration free of ideology and predetermined goals. What saves us is not an idea, but an encounter, a presence, and that's what awakens us to our best selves. And it gives us what the market economy can never give us, worth and dignity as people. On the very first immersion program I ran to, ran to South Africa, to Copenhagen, um, the girls are billeted among the very poor mothers, so they get to collect their water. Um, their biggest fear is that they won't have a shower for the length of time they are there. And this particular morning, Mary Chabalala came out of her house with Megan and was walking to the project. And she looked down at Megan's feet and saw that Megan hadn't bothered to wash her feet. She said, we must go back home, and Megan didn't quite realize why. She said, sit down, I'll be back in a minute, and she went out to the communal tap and came back with a bowl of water. And then it cotton she cottoned on that she hadn't bothered to wash her feet. Oh, I can do it, don't worry, don't worry. And Mary Shabalala said, you are my daughter, and I will wash your feet. And she did, and Megan will never, ever forget that incredible act of loving service um, that was given to her. She will never go as a Catholic to the Holy Thursday ritual, where unfortunately we have separated ourselves from a real symbolic value because the disciples would have had very dirty feet um, and we have made our Eucharist, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, we've made it a, a, a little piece of ice cream wafer. That doesn't take away the symbolism, what it means for me. But we have divorced ourselves from the symbols that will nourish us. So this is a sacred journey we are on, to heal the scars of our times, to liberate us for that deep connection to one another and the earth as mindful stewards. It will shape us with profound respect and humility so that what we cherish as a community here, we can hand on to future generations. What does it cost us? We risk ourselves as guarantors in a world where such values are threatened and compromised, so that through our concrete actions, presence, and witness, we encounter one another. This is not just a, a wish dream, but it is a path to a better future. By coming here together at church and in, in church as community, by our courage and care for one another and compassion, we honor each person's intrinsic dignity and worth. Care will change our world, not our political persuasion, although that might help. It's care that will bring about the change. You as you are, we as we are together, we take on this task. We are invited to deepen that mystery of life itself, to connect with the extravagant abundance of all that makes for the well-being of every life that exists on this planet. Let us be wonderfully awake for what we are willing to create for the future, for each other. And as in the hymn, hymn we opened with, come, yet again come, let us keep working at them as we heard in our closing verse in the reflection, continue to love deeply and risk everything for the good, the just, and the true. Thank you. <laughs>